Hello and welcome to this training program on CPR and defibrillation. This is hosted by Paramedical Services, who are a registered training organization which have nationally accredited courses by ASQA. This online training session is an essential component of HLT AID 001, which is Provide Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation or CPR, HLT AID 003, which is Provide First Aid, and HLT AID 004, which is provide an emergency first aid response in an education and care setting. In overview of the online training session, we will be discussing the legal issues surrounding first aid. Then we'll have a look at some of the associated anatomy of the airway, the respiratory system, and the cardiovascular system in order to help us to understand why we do certain things during CPR and defibrillation. We will pay special note to the differences between adults and infants and children. Then we'll have a look at the chain of survival and how this is integrated into our DRS ABCD when we manage a patient in cardiac arrest or in any first aid emergency. Then we'll have a look at the post-incident formalities which need to occur after any major incident. There are a few legal issues to be aware of when providing first aid care and treatment. The first one is consent. Consent is the permission or the agreement for you to provide any sort of medical care. If somebody is under the age of 16 years, they require consent from either a parent or a guardian. If in the event that somebody is unconscious or we are unable to gain consent from a parent or a guardian, we fall under the category of implied consent. This means that if that person was conscious or if that parent or guardian were present on the scene, they would agree to you providing first aid treatment and care to them in their condition. Next, there is duty of care. Duty of care is the moral obligation to ensure the safety or well-being to others. This means that if you were to come across a person who was ill or injured in your workplace or in any other environment, that it would be your moral obligation to provide medical assistance to this person and also call for assistance to ensure that they receive the appropriate care. Negligence is when Someone has failed to take proper care of a patient where they have acted either irresponsibly or they have done something that they have not been trained or educated in doing. Confidentiality is very important. When we're treating any patient or especially a minor and they divulge personal information to us, we need to ensure that we do not discuss this information with anybody else except for a caregiver or a health giver that we are handing over to. Any sharing of information outside of this can be considered a breach in confidentiality. And last but not least, we need to ensure that we treat every casualty and every patient with the utmost respect. We need to take into consideration all nationalities living in Australia with many different cultural and spiritual beliefs and it's very important that we ensure that we always treat each person with respect and integrity. In this next section, we're going to have a look at an overview of the anatomy. The reason that we're doing this is that you can understand why we do certain procedures in our DRS ABCD and resuscitation. First, we're going to have a look at the upper airway. The upper airway consists of the nose, the mouth, the tongue, and the throat. Just having a closer look at the mouth over here, we can see the tongue takes up a huge space within the mouth. But looking closer, we can see the tongue is firmly cemented into the front part of the jaw and the bottom part of the jaw. The tongue is the most common cause of an upper airway obstruction. But there's an old wives tale that circulates that says that if somebody can swallow their tongue, especially if they're unconscious or having a seizure, so they recommended before to put a spoon or a stick or something in their mouth to stop people swallowing their tongue. But we can see from just looking at the anatomy, the way that the tongue is cemented into the jaw, that it is absolutely impossible for someone to swallow their tongue. So we never place anything inside of their mouth when somebody is unconscious or having a seizure. However, when somebody is unconscious, 
the tongue relaxes and it can flop to the back of the throat just over here and that can cause that airway obstruction. We can do some very basic maneuvers by tilting the head back and lifting up the person's chin to cause the tongue to move off the back of the throat and open that airway again. And you'll have ample time to practice this in your face-to-face -face training sessions. So when somebody goes to take a deep breath in, air is sucked in through the nose and the mouth and it goes to the back of the throat over here and then it gets passed down into this front pipe just here which is called the windpipe. This back pipe over here is called the esophagus and that's the tube that leads down to the stomach. And the epiglottis over here is what protects our windpipe when we are eating or drinking or swallowing some substance. When we go to swallow some food or some liquids, the tongue pushes back on the epiglottis and it closes over our windpipe to stop us from choking on everything that we eat. The lower airway is comprised of the windpipe, the two lungs, the left and the right hand side lung, the bronchi, which are the branches of the windpipe that extend into the lung. Now, as these branches get smaller and smaller, they move down to these tiny little air sacs right at the base of our lungs that are called alveoli. And this is the place in the lungs where all that good air that you've just breathed in sends oxygen into our bloodstream and takes all that carbon dioxide out of our bloodstream for us to breathe out. Now we're going to have a look at the cardiovascular or the circulatory system. The heart is responsible for pumping blood around the body. All arteries, which are usually colored in red on any medical diagrams, carry blood away from the heart and they're usually rich and full of oxygen. The capillaries are the tiny little blood vessels right down in your fingers and toes where oxygen then moves from your bloodstream into the cells and carbon dioxide moves out. The carbon dioxide is then returned to the heart through your veins and this brings that blood back to your lungs so that you can breathe that carbon dioxide out and get your blood oxygenated again. An adult human body has approximately 5 to 6 liters of blood. However, children and infants have a lot less blood in their body. The amount of blood in the body is worked out by mils per kg. An infant has approximately 85 mils per kg in it. So if we have an infant who weighed approximately 4 kgs and they had 85 mils per kg of blood in them, they would only have a total of 340 mils. That's the equivalent of just enough fluid that fills up a Coke can. So you can see a small little infant or a child who has blood loss from a cut or a wound is at much higher risk than that of an adult because they have less blood circulating in their body. So let's have a look about how the circulatory and respiratory system work together. Here we have a picture of the lungs on one side, so that's representing the respiratory system and a heart on the other side of the screen representing our circulatory system. The heart pumps oxygen rich blood out to the body. So that goes to our brain, our vital organs, all the way down to our fingers and toes. Your cells use up all that good oxygen and returns carbon dioxide to the bloodstream. This blood is now carried from your veins up to the other side of your heart. Your heart then pumps that oxygen poor blood off to the lungs. You breathe out the carbon dioxide, you breathe in the oxygen, your blood gets oxygenated and it returns back to your heart. So these two systems work together very, very closely. And when one system fails to work, the other will shut down very rapidly. So if we have a patient who stops breathing, it'll only take a minute or two until their heart stops working properly. Just remember, very basically, air must go in and just remember, air must go in and out and blood must go round and round to keep the system working. When we're doing CPR, we do our chest compressions, which helps to pump the heart, which moves the blood around the body. And we do our ventilations in between our compressions. And this helps to ensure that we get that oxygen into the bloodstream that then gets pumped around the body. So we artificially take over the normal functioning of the respiratory and cardiovascular system when we're doing CPR. 
Infants and children are physically very different to adults. If we understand those differences, it will help us to treat them more effectively in an emergency. Here are some general differences between children and adults. Up until the age of eight years, the child's head is proportionally bigger to the body than an adult's is. The airway structure of children is generally narrower and less stable than that of an adult. The importance of this will be explained a little further on in the lecture when we're talking about opening the airway of an infant, child or an adult. The chest wall in a child or an infant is more flexible and offers less protection to the internal organs such as the heart and the lungs. The abdominal organs in children are closer together than that of adults. So just be aware that in any kind of traumatic incident, a child may be at higher risk of internal injuries than that of an adult. The skin in children is thinner and more elastic than the skin of an adult, and they have more fat underneath the skin tissue, which is called subcutaneous fat, and they have a larger body surface area to mass ratio. What this means is that the child has an increased risk of hypo or hypothermia. Hypothermia is when the body becomes too cold to function properly and hyperthermia is when the body is too warm or too hot to function normally. These differences in the skin can also result in a higher rate of dehydration in children, so we need to watch out for that. Children generally have a higher heart rate, respiratory rate and metabolic rate than that of adults. And because of the lower blood volumes in children, Children and infants may experience significant volume loss or dehydration from things such as vomiting and diarrhea than that of adults. Now that we've had a good look and you've got a basic understanding of the anatomy and physiology and the differences between infants, children and adults, we're going to have a look at basic life support. Basic life support can be provided by any first aider or lay person. This is the process that we undergo with following our DRS ABCD and providing CPR for a patient. We're going to have a look at the chain of survival and how this encourages us to increase the survival rates of someone who is in cardiac arrest. It's estimated that more than 95% of sudden cardiac arrest victims die before reaching hospital. However, when people are trained in their DRS, ABCD, and the links of the chain of survival are strong, the survival rates for patients can increase to as high as 40%. What are the links in the chain of survival? First off, the first link to look at is early access. This means that we contact the emergency services as soon as possible, and also recognizing that somebody is in cardiac arrest. The next is initiating early CPR. The sooner we start CPR on a person, the sooner their chances of survival increase. The next is early defibrillation. We'll talk a little bit later on in more in depth about defibrillation and how it works on the heart and why it actually saves lives. But it's important to understand at this stage, the sooner we get the defibrillator onto the patient and we provide the shocks, that we can increase their chance of survival dramatically. And the last link in the chain of survival here is, is early advanced life support or ALS. Now the slide before I just told you that we are all learning BLS, so this is basic life support. So advanced life support can be provided by anybody with advanced training. That can be a paramedic, a nurse, a doctor or any other advanced trained medical health professional. The primary survey, the DRS ABCD approach, ties and links in with our chain of survival and I'll show you that as we go through. You may have heard about the DRS ABCD or doctor's ABCD approach and we'll just go through it now to clarify these points. D stands for danger. When you walk on scene you need to make sure that it's safe for you to approach because you don't want to become injured or become a patient yourself. So always assess the area for any dangers that you could be exposed to. The next is checking response. We're testing here to see if the patient has a good level of consciousness or a very poor level of consciousness. Next is send for help. Now we need to make sure that we call for an ambulance or engage that early access as soon as possible because if you don't send for help you'll be stuck on your own for a very long time. 
Check the person's airway. We need to make sure that the airway is clear and open in order for the person to be breathing adequately. Check the person's breathing. C stands for compressions. Now in the past, C used to stand for checking circulation. So people were taught and advised on how to check for a pulse. But this can sometimes be a very difficult thing to do, especially in an emergency situation. And as we've seen in previous slides that the lungs and the heart are very interconnected. And if somebody is not breathing, their heart is not going to be pumping properly. So we need to take over that function for them and start compressions immediately. D stands for defibrillation. So if someone is in cardiac arrest and you're performing CPR on them, they need a defibrillator. Now I'll just show you how these links in the chain of survival tie in. Sending for help is obtaining early access. Compressions is starting early CPR. Defibrillation is early defibrillation. And what comes after that is the adv early advanced life support. That's when the paramedics arrive. So a question to you is when should I use the principles of DRS ABCD? And the answer to that is immediately in any patient who is unconscious or in a life-threatening emergency. The Australian and New Zealand Resuscitation Council that governs our practice has these very handy posters on their webpage which you can print off and stick up in your workplace. This helps you just to remember the process of the DRS ABCD and I highly advise that any of you that do not have this in your workplace or childcare facility that you print one of these off their website and have it in an area that could be easily accessible in the case of an emergency. We are now going to go through every aspect of the DRS ABCD in detail so you have a full and thorough understanding of it. D standing for danger is anything that could cause harm to either yourself, a bystander or a casualty. Now it's very important to remember that when it comes to first aid procedures, you are the most important person on scene because if you do not look after yourself and you don't stay safe, you can become another casualty. Take a few seconds to think about your workplace, your environment, your school, wherever you may be and what possible dangers there could be around you. Dangers can include anything from animals, insects and pests, to cables that people could trip over, electricity, motor vehicles, other people or bystanders, needles, water spills and many other things. If the scene is unsafe to approach and there's dangerous aspects there and you cannot contain the hazard or move the patient away from the hazard, call the appropriate authorities and wait in a safe place until they arrive. When managing a patient, it's very important to protect yourself from biological hazards too. If you do have available, especially in your first aid kits, there should be a pair of gloves there. Ensure that you put on a pair of gloves before touching a patient, especially if they've bloodied or soiled. If in the event that you were to get a finger prick or you did not have a pair of gloves available and you touched a patient that was bloodied or soiled, it's very important to wash your hands thoroughly and immediately and report any of these incidents to your supervisors. You may need to seek medical attention, particularly when it comes to a needle stick injury. Another standard precaution that may be available to you is a pocket mask or even a face mask for resuscitation. When you're doing mouth to mouth with any patient, you need to be aware that there could be things such as blood or vomitus in the mouth and these devices protect you from that patient. So have a look in your first aid kits in your workplace or your environment that you're in and just check that you do have something there that can either be used in CPR during mouth to mouth or have a pair of gloves available in the event of an emergency. When checking the response on a patient, with adults and children, we use the touch and talk technique. So we grab the patient by their shoulders, give their shoulders a bit of a squeeze, call out to the patient, say, hello, can you hear me? Open your eyes, what's your name? You can also ask them to squeeze your hands. If they don't respond to the cow's technique, then try and do a slight painful stimulus. 
Now this painful stimulus does not mean pinching or poking the patient, but it's a gentle squeeze on the top of the shoulder muscles to see if they respond to any pain. With infants, however, we do something slightly differently. When we're trying to obtain a response from an infant, we can rub their chest with our hand, or we can also scrape the bottom of our foot with our finger or our nail. This doesn't inflict too much harm to them because remember children have got very thin skin and we don't want to damage any of their soft tissues that are lying underneath their skins. We treat them more gently and with lots more care. The whole process of the DRS ABCD and checking response, checking airway and breathing will be demonstrated and you'll have ample time to practice this during your face-to-face -face training in the practical sessions. We check the response in somebody because we want to know what level of consciousness they are. There are three levels of consciousness. Conscious, meaning somebody is fully awake and alert and able to respond to us. Semi-conscious is when somebody is a bit drowsy and not really completely awake. And then we have unconscious. This is when somebody is completely unresponsive to any stimulus that we give them and they do not respond at all. If the casualty is not responding, or if the casualty is responding and you obtain a bit of history and you see that they are in a life-threatening situation, send for help. For contacting an ambulance in Australia, the numbers are 000, or if you're using a mobile service, you can dial 112. When assessing the airway of an adult patient, in order to open the airway completely, and be able to assess inside, we need to do what's called a head tilt chin lift. I want to draw your attention to the diagram on the right hand side over here. We mentioned at the very beginning in the anatomy and physiology about the big tongue muscle that can relax and fall to the back of the throat and block up that airway. This is a great picture to show you what that looks like. When we do a head tilt chin lift, one hand is placed on the forehead and tilts the head backwards and the other hand lifts the chin up. In doing this process, because the tongue is attached firmly to the chin, it lifts that tongue off the back of the airway and allows air to move from the nose and the mouth into the windpipe and down to the lungs. However, things are quite different for infants. One of the fundamental differences between infants and adults is that infants' heads are very large in comparison to their bodies than that of an adult. Because their head is so big, when they're laying flat on their back, the head naturally tilts into what's called the sniffing position, is what we try to obtain when we do a head tilt chin lift on an adult patient. So all we need to do to open the airway of an infant is make sure that they're lying on a flat surface on their back and their head will naturally tilt into an open position. Now for any children in between an infant and an adult, there may need to be a slight tilt to their head that we perform just depending on the size of their body. So a very small child that's about two or three years old, we will only need to do a very, very gentle tilt versus a child who's about 14 years old. Then we will do a bit more of an exaggerated head tilt. This will be demonstrated to you during your face-to-face -face training session and you will have ample time in practicing how to do this properly. Now that we have the airway open, it's very important to check inside the airway to look for any kind of obstructions. If there is anything inside the airway, any foreign bodies, vomit or blood or any type of liquid, it's important that we open the patient's airway, roll them into the recovery or the Haynes position and clear their airway using two fingers sweeping through the mouth. Here are some causes of upper airway obstructions that you need to be aware of. The most common cause of an upper airway obstruction is the tongue, but we now know how to remove the tongue off the back of the airway by doing a head tilt chin lift in an adult and to put the child or the infant into the neutral position or the sniffing position to make sure that their airway is open. Solids can be another factor of an upper airway obstruction. So anybody could choke on things like toys, foreign bodies, or even food substances. This can also include different liquids. Solids and liquids can be removed from somebody's airway 
by rolling them into the recovery position and using a finger sweep with a gloved hand to remove it from their mouth or their airway. Swelling can be another cause of an upper airway obstruction. Swelling can be caused by trauma, burns to the upper airway, infection and allergic reactions. Children and infants are most prone to getting really severe upper airway infections such as croup and epiglottitis which can cause swelling and closing of the upper airway. And more and more people are prone to getting severe allergic reactions or what's called anaphylaxis that causes swelling of the upper airway and closing of the airway. It is important to be able to identify each of these upper airway obstructions and what we can do to manage them. When assessing for breathing, we need to do three things. We need to look, listen, and feel. When we look for respirations, we're looking for movement of the chest or of the upper abdomen. If we see a good rise and fall, that indicates that somebody is breathing. When we listen, we need to listen near the mouth and the nose for air moving in and out. When we feel for breathing, we can feel for breathing when the air moves in and out against our cheek or against our ear, or we can place a hand on the upper chest or abdomen. Please note that when listening for breathing, it's important that the airway remains open. You can see in the diagram on the right that the lady is holding the man's head in the open position. She's doing a head tilt chin lift to ensure that airway is open. If the airway is not open, you will not hear any air movement in or out. So please ensure that you do this appropriately. If the patient is breathing normally, place the patient into the recovery or the Haynes position and just monitor them until help arrives. If the patient is not breathing or not breathing adequately, commence CPR straight away. If the patient is breathing adequately, we're gonna move them into what's called the recovery position or the position that we strongly advocate, the Haynes position. To perform the Haynes position, firstly kneel down next to the patient. The arm furthest away from you, you put straight up alongside their head. Cross the arm closest to you over the patient's chest. Lift up the closest knee to you. And then what you do is placing your hand behind the patient's knee and behind the patient's shoulder, you gently roll them away from you onto their side. You'll see in the diagram here that the knee will then rest against the floor over there and the elbow will rest against the floor. In this position, the arm actually keeps the neck in a nice stable position. So if anybody has any form of spinal injury, it's kept quite safe by using this Haynes position versus the recovery position. Just to make a note here that all practical procedures will be trained again in the face-to-face -face training session and you'll have ample time to practice them. As we mentioned before, if the patient is not breathing or not breathing adequately, then we will commence CPR. This term not breathing adequately means that if the patient is not taking smooth steady breaths but they're rather gasping one breath every now and again, that's not enough to support life and like we mentioned at the beginning that if the patient stops breathing or they're not breathing adequately, very soon after that, the heart is going to start malfunctioning. So it's important that the sooner we start CPR, get early CPR and early compression starting, the better the chance of survival is for this person. And this ties directly into the second link in our chain of survival, early compressions and early CPR. We're going to go through some of the differences that there are when we're doing CPR on adults, children, and infants. First, having a look at the hand positions. In the adult, we're gonna ensure that we use two hands to the mid or lower sternum when we're doing our compressions. The reason why we do this is because we need to ensure that we are putting the appropriate weight and pressure onto the person's chest to ensure that we are compressing the chest to the proper depth. In the child, we can use one or two hands, depending on the size of the child. To give an example, if we had a three or four year old child who had quite a small body, we would only be using one hand to ensure that we get the correct depth. However, if the child was a 14 year old child whose body size was a lot larger, almost similar to an adult, 
then we would be using two hands to ensure that we get the appropriate depth in our compressions. For the infant, we are only going to be using two fingers. The infant has a much more pliable rib cage and much more flexible chest, as we've already discussed in our anatomy and physiology. So we only need to use two fingers on the mid to low sternum to ensure that we get the appropriate depth during compression. For adults, children and infants, the compression depth will be one third the depth of the chest. In order to give the appropriate ventilations in an adult child and infant, we just need to give a breath until we see a rise and fall of the chest. And you'll notice in an adult, this might be a slightly bigger breath compared to an infant, which you may only need to give a small puff to. The ratio of compressions to ventilations in the adult, child and infant is all 30 compressions to two breaths. This makes it nice and easy to remember whether you're dealing with an infant, a child or an adult. Please note that the compressions come first and then the breaths. So we always start off with 30 chest compressions, then we administer two breaths or two ventilations. The rate at which we give compressions is 100 to 120 compressions per minute. This enables us to give approximately five cycles of 30 compressions to two breaths per minute. And here are some pictures just to help you visualize how many hands you use for the adult, child or infants. The diagram on the adult over here, we use two hands on the sternum on the mid to lower portion. Here's a picture of the child. You can see they're in the nice sniffing position and the person is using one hand, the heel of the hand on the sternum, the lower half doing the chest compressions. Then on the infant, it's the lower half of the sternum again using only two fingers to do the compressions. If any time during CPR the patient vomits, stop your compressions immediately and roll the patient onto their side and clear the airway by using the two finger sweep technique which we spoke about already. There are a few special considerations to take into note while doing CPR on a pregnant woman or on a drowning victim. In pregnancy, especially later on when the person is full term and the baby has grown nice and big, we need to be aware that if a pregnant woman is laying flat on her back, the baby can compress all the major blood vessels. So when we're doing CPR, it's very difficult for blood to move around their body. What we can do is we put a little wedge in underneath their right hip, or we can put a towel or a jersey or a pillow underneath it, just to tilt the pelvis slightly and move the baby off those great vessels. This makes CPR so much more effective and increases their chance of survival. The drowning victim may require prolonged resuscitation and this is because their lungs have been filled with fluid. It's very important that when the person is removed from the water, when checking the airway and breathing, they need to be in the Haynes position. This helps to clear the airway properly before starting CPR. It's important to know when to stop CPR as well. If the scene ever becomes unsafe for you and you are in danger, you need to stop CPR and remove yourself from that situation. If the casualty responds, so if they start to breathe normally or you start to see signs of life, such as the patient moving and trying to take breaths, then we stop CPR and recheck the airway, breathing, and then wait for help. If it's impossible for you to continue for example, if you become completely exhausted and there's no one around to help you, then you have to stop CPR as well. Another example is if a healthcare professional arrives and takes over CPR from you, or if a healthcare professional directs that CPR be stopped because the person's injuries are not compatible with life. The next step is defibrillation. If someone is in cardiac arrest and you are doing CPR on them, they need a defibrillator. That is the next link in the chain of survival, which is early defibrillation. While CPR is essential to maintain that artificial circulation and ventilation for the person, early defibrillation is the only thing that ultimately saves their lives. So timing is crucial. For each minute that defibrillation is delayed, the chance of survival decreases by approximately 10%. If you've been doing CPR on a patient for 10 minutes and there's been no defibrillation, 
their chance of survival is nearly zero. So time to defibrillation is the most important determinant of survival from cardiac arrest. Here we have some facts about sudden cardiac arrest. Over 50,000 Australians are victims of sudden cardiac arrest each year. Cardiovascular disease kills one Australian every 12 minutes. 75% of sudden cardiac arrests happen outside of hospital. The current survival rate is less than 3% and approximately 140 Australians die each day from out of hospital sudden cardiac arrest. So you can see it's important that more people get trained on how to do CPR and more defibrillators are available out there in the workplace and in the community to help save lives. What is cardiac arrest? Cardiac arrest is defined as someone who is unconscious or unresponsive. They're not breathing or not breathing adequately. And remember that means gasping and there are no signs of life. Here are some heart rhythms to show you what happens when someone goes into cardiac arrest. First, we'll have a look at the normal heart rhythm up here at the top. Now, this is what the heart normally does every day, 24 hours a day. And we can see that the pattern of the movements in the heart all look exactly the same to each other. It all looks regular. It all looks like a normal shape that's continued on in a regular pattern. When somebody goes into cardiac arrest, they can either be in what's called a shockable rhythm or a non-shockable rhythm. A shockable rhythm can be something called ventricular fibrillation, which is this very messy, uncoordinated heart rhythm over here, or ventricular tachycardia, which is also an uncoordinated but slightly more regular rhythm. Now, we don't need to know these, but I'm just showing them to you so you have a better understanding of what happens to the heart when it goes into cardiac arrest. These two rhythms are called shockable rhythms, and that's because we can shock them with a defibrillator. When we use the defibrillator on a shockable rhythm, it knocks out all of these uncoordinated heart rhythms and allows the heart to go back into a normal rhythm that we see up at the top over here. However, if we delay getting a defibrillator onto a person, if they've been in cardiac arrest for a very long time, they go into what's called a non-shockable rhythm. You may have heard on TV before, they might shout out when someone goes into cardiac arrest, they're flatlining. And we can see why it's called flatlining because it looks like a very flat, smooth line. What that flat, smooth line means is that there is no rhythm and no movement. Nothing is happening inside the heart. So there's nothing to shock. That's why it's called a non-shockable rhythm. Now, we won't be able to necessarily see what rhythm the patient is in, but thankfully the defibrillator is very clever and it can pick up what rhythm the patient is in. And then it'll advise us whether we're going to give a shock to the patient or not. So what does defibrillation actually do and how does it work? Defibrillation is an electrical shock to the heart. So when we place the defibrillator onto a patient's chest, it analyzes the rhythm that the person is in. The defibrillator then tells us whether we need to deliver a shock or not. When the defibrillator analyzes that the patient is in VF or VT and says that shock required, the defibrillator will charge up. It'll tell us to press the flashing button. Then if you press the flashing shock button, an electrical shock is sent through the heart very rapidly and it knocks out and stops all that uncoordinated heart rhythms. This allows a regular normal rhythm and a pulse to start up again. Defibrillation is the only definitive treatment for an unconscious patient with VF or VT. So who do we use the AED on? We only defibrillate patients that are in cardiac arrest. So this means the person is unconscious or unresponsive, not breathing or not breathing adequately with no signs of life. So we have to be doing CPR on a patient if we're going to use a defibrillator. I just want to make a point here about cardiac arrest is very different to a heart attack. Cardiac arrest means the heart has stopped working normally. Cardiac arrest is when someone is unconscious and unresponsive, not breathing, not breathing adequately, and no signs of life. A heart attack occurs is when somebody's got a blockage in the blood vessel of the heart. Someone who's having a heart attack is generally awake and talking to us. 
So please be aware you have to be doing CBR on a person first before you bring out the defibrillator. It should never be placed on a conscious patient. Please also note that any AED or adult defibrillator pads should not be used on a child that is under the weight of 25 kgs or under the age of 8 years. This is because the electrical shock that is released from the adult pads is much higher than that of the infant or child pads. So just make sure that when dealing with a child or an infant under the age of 8 or 25 kgs that you are using the child or infant pads that are provided. There are a few safety tips to be aware of around using an AED. The first is that the AED should never be connected to a patient unless the patient is in cardiac arrest. So that means that we're doing CPR on this person. Do not place the chest pads over a pacemaker or a nitro patch. A pacemaker is generally fitted on the left hand side of a patient's chest when their heart doesn't beat properly. It's quite obvious to see it's a big box that's inserted underneath the skin on the left hand side of the chest. So if you're placing the pads in the normal position, this should not be a problem at all. Nitro patches are medication patches which can be on a patient. They could have placed this anywhere on their arms or their chest. But if a nitro patch is in the way of where you want to place your pads, just remove it with a gloved hand and then you can place your pads on the patient's chest. Do not touch the patient during shock delivery. If you do this, you could get a nasty shock and it could interfere with your heart rhythm too. For those of who are doing advanced recess, please ensure that if you are using supplemental oxygen, it needs to be removed while delivering shock. Use the AED with caution if the patient is surrounded or saturated by water. Keep in mind that the pads are sticky and they will not stick to a person's skin unless they are dry. So we need to make sure that we dry the patient's chest before applying the pads. Remove any jewelry and excessive hair from the neck and chest area by using the razor that is provided in the AED packs. Take care to apply the pads correctly. It's very important that the electrical shock goes through the heart in the correct direction. And ensure you remove all clothing off the patient so no clothing is stuck underneath the pads. Each pad has a clear picture on it about where it needs to be placed. One pad needs to be placed on the right hand side of the chest underneath the person's collarbone. And the other pad needs to be placed on the left hand side of the chest in line with the underarm. When dealing with a larger child, you may be able to place the pads the same as you would on the adult. However, with smaller children and infants, where there's not enough space on the chest for the pads to fit, you can do the front and back technique. One pad will be placed on the front of the child's chest and this will be indicated on the pads which one to use. And the other pad will be placed between the child's shoulder blades on the back. So the electrical shock will go straight through the chest from front to back. Please note that once you have placed the pads on the chest, they are not to be removed at all. The emergency services may remove the pads that you have placed on to place on new pads which would be compatible with their defibrillator. Also keep in mind that defibrillator pads are one person use only. So ensure that you replace them after they have been used. Here are some important aspects to be aware of when looking after your AED. Regularly check the AED. We need to ensure that the pads and the batteries are all in date. Pads should be replaced after use because they are one use only. Check that all the components of the AED are accounted for. Turn on the AED or defibrillator to check for any faults and check for battery status. Follow your organizational procedures for reporting or replacing any faults with the AED. In the event that the battery goes flat on the AED, go back to the basics and just continue doing CPR and call for help or for another AED to be made available and replace the battery as soon as possible. The last link in the chain of the survival is when advanced life support arrives. So when you call the emergency services and they finally arrive, here are some important things to hand over to them in an emergency situation. We use an acronym called MIST. M stands for the mechanism of injury or illness, so what happened to the person. I is the injuries that you 
that you can see or that are suspected to be there. S is the signs and symptoms and T is the treatment provided. So to give you an example of this, if you came across an individual who was collapsed in the shopping center, not breathing, no signs of life, and you started CPR and provided defibrillation, how you would hand this over to the emergency services and say, I found this gentleman lying on the floor. I don't know what happened to him. I haven't seen that there are any injuries on his body, but what I have noted is the patient was not breathing. They were not conscious. So I started CPR. I got the defib and called for help and we defibrillated the patient and then you arrived. So that's giving them an overall view of what might have happened, which helps the emergency services to pick up any clues that they need to treat this patient further. Once you've handed over and you're walking away from the scene, it's very important to take note of aftercare. Firstly, clean up. Clean the accident site for soil dressings and ensure personal hygiene. Make sure you wash your hands afterwards. Restock things like your first aid kits or your defibrillation pads or call for one of the services that arrange your first aid kits for you. Sit down, gather your thoughts and steady your nerves. Report the incident and fill out any necessary workplace documentation while maintaining confidentiality. It is important to talk with your supervisor or relevant personnel to ensure that they have a full understanding of the incident and also for your own well-being to make sure that you have talked through all the steps and procedures and you're feeling quite all right. Then one of the most important aspects is stress management. Recognize your own skills and limitations and ensure that you seek support if you're not coping after an incident. Be aware of psychological impact after a traumatic event. After an incident, there are different types of behavioral changes that you may observe in a child or an adult suffering from stress. These can be tiredness, exhaustion, unwilling to focus or to work, unwillingness to play, generally looking quite sad, loss of appetite or a major gain of appetite, not sleeping appropriately and becoming very temperamental and moody. How can you assist in this? If you notice that one of your colleagues, co-workers or a child that you are in care of is not coping well with the stress after a traumatic incident, try talking with them. Often people just need someone to talk things through with and to be a friend. If that person is requiring further attention though, be wise and direct them on to counselling services that would be able to help. In completion of this online learning program, we're just going to run through the basic life support steps one last time. The basic life support steps are our DRS ABCD action plan. So firstly, when approaching any scene or casualty, check for dangers to make sure the scene is safe for you. Next, check for response by using the touch and talk technique and maybe a painful stimulus if required. Call 000 and send for help. Open the airway using your head tilt chin lift or an infant's keep them laying flat on their back. Check inside the airway for any obstruction. Look, listen and feel for normal breathing. If the patient is not breathing or not breathing adequately, start CPR. Start be CPR by giving 30 compressions followed by two rescue breaths. As soon as possible, attach the defibrillator and follow the prompts. Again, please keep in mind that all these steps and processes will be gone over and you'll have ample time to practice in your face-to-face -face practical training sessions. Thank you for listening to this online training video. If you would like to further your education, here are some more available courses from paramedical services.